not really related, but somehow, uh, because I work from the last sermon that I did, it just came back to my mind, and I put it somewhere on the 4th and 5th, so I just sent a note to GIE, because uh, just now when I hear pastor and singing, the Lord just reminded me uh, to, to, to just uh, remind us about the real purpose of, here, of us here um, every uh, Sunday morning, and not only every Sunday morning, but also about our Christian life. <coughs> that uh, when we come together, that we have to move uh, from the outer court to the holy place and then to the holy of holies. And that is our desire that all of us as a family of God, that we will move into the Holy of Holies, uh, and we just read it in the communion, yeah, that uh, our lives do not only stay in the outer court where we believe in Jesus, which was the sacrifice done by Jesus, we receive Him as our Lord and Savior, this is the baptism, and this is our part of our world, that we are saved by grace, and not by works, but we are saved for good works. And uh, this is our part. We also mentioned uh, some time ago about us, that uh, God uh, made us, uh, the physical, the, the soul, and the spirit. And the two verses that uh, uh, encourage us is, uh, yeah, these two verses, uh, go to the next one, these are the two verses. There's uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. That, uh, that we move from the elementary uh, to maturity and that we not always just um, stay at the elementary level, just always uh, uh, waiting for milk, but we would be challenged to be ready to take a solid food and to grow. I think that's why we are here in church. Uh, that's why we come and we together as family will worship God and uh, we pray and we hear the word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's all pray together. Amen. Father God, and thank you. Uh, commit uh, your word to you, for your word is active and living. So we, uh, Lord, we open our hearts uh, that you will teach us our Lord. Uh, let us uh, uh, transform to the revelation of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to ask you a quiz. Uh, there are many names I'm going to put up. First slide. Twelve names here. These are the 12 names from the Bible. I want you to be very uh, honest. If you know all of them, just put up your hands. If you know one of them, put up your hand. Okay, maybe about that. If you know two or more, put up your hands. Pass them up. Congratulations. When I was given uh, this book, I read the book of Acts and I purposely tried to find the names of each other because it reflects the church. There are many people in this church that you do not know. There are many names in this church that you don't know. Okay, go to the next slide. Now, I added many more names here. Probably now become more familiar, isn't it? All these names are found in the book of Acts. Okay? All in the book of Acts. And if you do not believe it, just write a few down and check it so that you know you are like a Berean who check everything that the preacher said. And this is what you should do. Don't just believe what the preacher said. Okay, check it, write it down and go back and check it like the books of Acts said, like a Berean. Check it. So the names here represent a lot of things because this was the time when the church were first started and there was this explosive growth of church in the early days. When Jesus asked the 12 disciples and the others, which in total 120 to wait, to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus asked them to wait. So 120 of them waited and on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And I'm sure you've heard many messages on what happened and how the church 
then grew rapidly, rapidly, because the people received the Holy Spirit, they were committed to the building of the church, and that is how the church grew. Now, I was given a topic, a very interesting topic about a person called Barnabas, and you saw his name, it's highlighted right here. Now, if I ask you Barnabas, I mean, in the ranking of uh, popularity or famous person in the church, it's probably quite low, quite low in the ranking. If I ask you to name the popular people in the church, people that uh, we pray for, oh, Father God, raise another Joshua in the midst, raise a Caleb, raise a Peter, raise a Paul among us. Sudden I see, we pray, God, raise a Barnabas within our church. Right? But today we will look at this uh, character because the theme for this month is learned from them. And we can learn not only from Peter, Paul, John, and all the famous uh, people in the Bible. You will see that there are so much of things that you can learn from what I call the unsung heroes in the Bible. What I call the people that have done a lot, but their names are not prominent. Just like in many, many of most churches, or in many, many churches, or even in churches like ours today. That there are many unsung heroes that do things quietly, but it's not known. <coughs> they contribute tremendously to the church, to the church growth. But they may not even be recognized. Okay, so that is the setting of uh, what uh, we want to do. And I want you to flip your Bible to read a few verses. Because the preaching, the learning will be from the book of Acts. So let us all just turn to the book of Acts. The first verse is uh, Acts 4.36. Acts 4.36. Okay? Just turn to your Bible. Okay? I, I, I didn't put it up there because I would like you all to just turn the Bible. Right? It's, it's good to turn the Bible to read from the Bible, and especially uncle is from the old generation that believe that you should have a physical Bible to, to turn. Because if you have a smartphone Bible, you'll be flipping from a Bible to Facebook to other messages, <laughs> and you, you are distracted. So Acts 4, 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son, of encouragement, so a few he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostle's feet. At first, when the parents called me to preach on Barnabas, immediately came to mind that uh, I should preach on encouragement because Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. And also, the church needs people that are encouraging. We know that. Right? We need a lot of encourager in the church. And sadly, that's missing in many churches. And that's why people stay unencouraged, demotivated, and even some may leave the church. But we need encouragement also because it's the nature of God to encourage. It's the nature of God to encourage. And it's good for you also to have this character of being an encourager. We'll talk a little bit more later. I want to turn another one. Huh? We have a few verses. Let's read it first, then we we'll talk about it. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 28. Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 28. Acts 9, 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostle. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Okay, remember that. 
that uh, Barnabas took Paul when he was still an unknown. In fact, people doubt whether he's a real Christian because of his background. He did many, many bad things to the Christians at the time. Yeah? So at that time, Barnabas took him. Then turn it again, another one. 11, 20 to 26. You see, this Barnabas guy is uh, it's not a well known guy. That's why he appears here and there. Not so many, not, not so often, right? He's not so well known. Uh, maybe <laughs> he's. Uh, look at that. Uh, verse, chapter 11, verse 20 to 26. Acts 11, verse 20 to 26. <laughs> What's uh, 20 to 26? Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Syrian men to Antioch and began to speak to Greek to telling them the good news about Jesus Christ. Their hands was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Okay, so uh, this is about about Peter after he received a message from God and then God asked him to also minister to the Gentiles that the ministry of salvation is not only for the Jews but then the, the Jews uh, doubted him the Jews argued with him and then he had to explain to them. And after he explained to them, the church of Antioch grew. Because many people, the Gentiles, they came to know about Christ and they received salvation. And when they received salvation, the church said, Okay, go and take a look. What is happening there? Something strange is happening there. So many uh, Gentiles are becoming Christian. So they saw, they told, uh, they sent Barnabas. And when Barnabas went there, he saw the great things. The grace of God was there and people received Jesus Christ. Then he went to look for Paul and he brought Paul there and he went there and then he ministered to them. Paul and Barnabas shared the gospel, taught them um, uh, about the gospel. Okay. Another one, chapter 15, verse 39. I'm going to pick all the key points, but in fact, uh, if you search Barnabas, uh, in the, it's only uh, 20 over verses about Barnabas in the Bible. Right? But you see how great this guy is. So 1539. Okay? Verse 15, verse 39 talk about they argue and then they parted. Paul and Barnabas argue so sharply and then they parted to me. Alright? Just remember that. They parted. And the last one is Galatian, the two books away, Galatian was chapter 2, verse 1. Galatian 2, verse 1. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along. I went in response to the Revelation and before the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. Barnabas was an encourager. I mentioned that the church needs a lot of encourager because it's the nature of God, it's the nature of our God, Jesus, to encourage. You know, Jesus never condemned. The Bible says that in Christ there is no condemnation. Only the devil, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus comes to give you life, life more abundantly. And if you look at Jesus, he never condemned. Even in the worst situation, like the case of those religious people trying to stone the, the, the woman who committed adultery. What was Jesus' last word? Anybody condemn you? No. Go and sin no more. So, it is the nature of our God to encourage. Remember the word that Jesus said, one day, when you see him, you know what he said he will remember? He will not remember the sin 
that you have committed because you have confessed, but he will remember a cold glass of water that you gave to the least. This is the kind of God that, that you believe in. The God that encourages you to do even little good things, like giving a glass of cold water. Now, of course, I wanted to preach on that, but Terence said, no, you preach on God, uh, God's hate hunter. <laughs> so I have to read about hate hunter. So I read about hate hunter. So I found that I'm living in the land of hate hunters. <laughs> So I did some reading. Sarawak is famous for its hate hunters. Why the people hate hunter? Is because they were warriors. Warriors defend their people. They defend their people. One of the way to defend is if somebody attack you, you attack back. And one way to show that you are really a warrior is to cut the head of another person and hang it in your house, in your longhouse. And he also described and I read about this characteristic of these head hunters, uh, of the head hunters in Sarawak. They will cut the head, they only take certain part of this the thing attached to the head and they will smoke the rest. It's kind of a ritual. And that is to make people like fear really these are really really awesome warriors. Okay? And then I read about why hate hunting is getting lesser and lesser in Sarawak. And there was an article by someone who lamented that hate hunting is no more in Sarawak, not interesting anymore. <laughs> why? Because of missionaries. Because of Christian missionaries who came to Sarawak and taught them this is no good. Hate hunting is not right. Okay? For the Lord Jesus Christ died at the cross for your sin, what you do is not right. And it seems that even now, if you want to find those scouts of hate hunters, it's very difficult because the missionary encouraged them to burn it or destroy it. That was what I read about hate hunting. And then I know also hate hunters in the modern days because we use some hate hunters to hate hunt talents for our company. <laughs> The purpose of headhunting talents for our company is so that we can get smart people, very clever people to join our company. Then they work very hard and they contribute, and then the company will make a lot of profit. Okay? So it's not the headhunting that will cut off the head, it's headhunting is to invite you to join the company. So that's the modern headhunting. What about the headhunting or headhunter that is described? that is being put to me about Barnabas. So let's look at the first part. What kind of hate hunter is Barnabas? Point number one. Point number one is from Acts 9.27. We have read that. For Barnabas chose or hate hunter Paul because Paul Preach the word of God in Jesus' name fearlessly. Barnabas chose headhunter Paul because he looked at this guy and he saw how he preached after he was converted. And he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Now I put to you that this is what we should look for. This is what we should hate hunt in our church. That we look among ourselves, look among our people, and we ask, who are the people who are willing to do things to speak for or to do things fearlessly in the name of Jesus? And we want to hate on you. Because that is the criteria of hate hunting and being hate hunted in the Bible context. That it is in the name of Jesus that we do things. That it is in the name of Jesus that we are going to build the church. 
So it is in the name of Jesus that you do things, that you build the church. And we want you, if you have the desire, and if your passion is there. It is also the characteristic of our God to choose people in the name of Jesus. Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man come to seek. He's looking. He looks. So it's bad to say, oh, God is also a hunter. It's not in that context. But God is also coming to look. Our God comes and He seek and He chose. Even before the creation of the world, God chose you to be holy and blameless in His sight. John 15, 16 said that you did not choose me. You did not choose God. God chose you and appointed you to be a fruit. Okay, so this is the point number one about hate hunting, I mean, about Barnabas, the character of Barnabas from the, uh, his ability to identify people in the church for service, to identify a talent in the church for people who are willing, people who uh, want to serve. That is what is in the mind of Barnabas. Let's move on to point number two. If you want to be a good head hunter, you must have the characteristic of a good head hunter. Because characters or your character either attracts people or repel people. Your characters, especially in the church context, in the business context, it can be a bit different because I can pay you a lot <laughs> and you have no choice. I have no choice because the offer is so good, I will join this company. But in the church context, because it's all about voluntary from the heart, about conviction, your character as a headhunter of somebody who wants to grow or groom the next generation in the church, either attracts or turn away. Let's look at the characteristics of Barnabas. Acts 11, 24 say, Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Verse 23, he saw the evidence of grace of God. He was glad and he encouraged all to remain true to the Lord. What kind of characters uh, that this person have? Acts 13 verse 43. Barnabas talked with them and urged them to continue on the grace of God. Acts 14 verse 3, he spoke boldly for the Lord. Are these characteristics in the people of God? Who wants to groom the next Paul in the church? Are these characteristics in the leadership of the church? If you want to bring up the generations of leaders for the church. Point number three. The follow me leadership. See, a lot of these things are in the Bible. Because we've been working so long, sometimes you go for courses, they send you to all this training. And you go for training and you learn, you say, hey, I thought this is familiar, I thought this is <laughs> Found in my own. But very sad to say that the business world, the outside world has taken a lot of this concept. And they're refining. Uh, 
uh, it will help them to build business, build cooperation. But the church, very sad to say that, fall behind. One example is the follow me uh, leadership. Barnabas was 27. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostle. Barnabas did not say, you go and see the apostle. He said, follow me. I will bring you to talk to the apostles because they doubted you. But I will go and explain to them. I will show you. Acts 11, 26 said, when he found him, when he found Paul, or Saul, at the time they still call him Saul, he brought him to Antioch. So he showed a leadership. He was a very practical leader, not only in theory, but in practice. So for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Do you know why you were called Christians? This is the first time. This is where the first time the people who believe Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior became Christian and they were called Christian. And this is in Acts 11, chapter 23. So when you go and talk to non Christians, what do you call why are you call Christian? Yeah? They were called Christian in India. In the Bible, there are only two persons that mention clearly this concept of follow me. First one is Jesus. If you read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many times you see Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. Very sad. I go to many, when I hear preaching sometimes uh, in many, many churches. Even the preacher say, don't follow me. Look at Jesus. Don't follow me. Look at Jesus. I'm only human. <laughs> it is so sad. Another person that said, follow me. Is Paul. All the old days prophets, they don't say follow me. They say listen to me. You see why sometimes I hesitate to preach? <laughs> because it's very old testament. It's very old testament. Listen to me. It's just like some parents at home so. Listen to me. Very Old Testament. But the New Testament, in the period of grace, Jesus said, Follow me. Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. No, listen to me. Follow me. So the young people in the church, they listen. But actually, what they want is somebody that they can follow. Some people in the church that they can look at and follow. Sadly, this is missing in many, many churches nowadays. Point number four. Acts 14, 12. Barnabas is a mentor who identified Paul, recruited him, be with him, train him, groom him. And I think that's the desire of many people in churches. Okay? And I know many people are doing that. Okay? And this not only happened in church context, it can be a smaller context in, in your family, in your business, in youth, in um, adults, in a subgroup. So you recruit someone, you train them, 
And in some cases, the person that you mentor or they call mentee becomes better and show talent and they show great talents. Sometimes maybe in your heart. But in the case of Barabbas, he, he was so humble and he accepted this. There was a case when they came to a place called Lystra. Paul and Barnabas was preaching to the people. A crippled man came, they healed this crippled man. And when they, after they healed this crippled man, all the people came up and started worshipping one of them. Worshipping. Literally bow down and worship them. And they worship them thinking and saying, Oh, Zeus and Hermas. Zeus and Hermas were their God. So they worship Paul and Barnabas thinking that they are gods who came and become human. So at that time, Paul stood up and he became the chief speaker. So he spoke many, many things. So Paul now rose up to become the leader. Rose up to become the leader above Barnabas, although Barnabas appointed him. But there was no sign at all of Barnabas being jealous of Paul taking over his position, being in the leadership, being the main speaker. And you see in verse 14, 15, verse 12, how they responded. The focus was not on who is going to be the leader, the spokesman, the person who said the file, but the truth is, my God, why are you guys worshipping me? I am just human like you all. Don't worship me. It is God. This is the message of Jesus. This is in His name that you are here. And I came to this point when I was writing this point. It came to me about this. I mentioned this earlier. I, I am just human. Right? You know, there's a song out there, young people sing. Because I'm only human, so I'm human. <laughs> 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 Children, you know, the modern song is going to affect your brain. The modern song affects your brain so subtly that you do not know. And then you use that as an excuse that you cannot live a Christian life. I'm only human, so I can sin and come back to church and confess and sin again. I think I preach uh, sometimes. No wonder. One day, Jesus said in his Bible that one day when people come and say, Jesus, I know, I know you are this. And Jesus said, I, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. And I've been thinking, why? And I mentioned that. Because you did not believe in the right Jesus. Okay? You just go say it and come back. But you did not believe in the Jesus that Matthew chapter 1 said. The Jesus that is your Savior that saved you from your sins. You believe in the wrong Jesus that is a forgiver. It's the wrong Jesus. So, when I wrote this, I it reflected in my mind that I'm only human. Right? So, because I'm only human, I tend to feel, I feel. But, the Bible said, when you receive Jesus, you are a new creation, no more in condemnation. You are a new creation. So, humility is the hallmark of spirituality. And Barnabas has it. Letting others become greater is a great thing, especially in the church context. In John 3.30, there's a guy that we know. His name is John the Baptist. So he belongs to our church if he's here today. <laughs> he should be with us if he's here today. 
John the Baptist said, when people came to him and said, hey, there's another guy over there named Jesus. He's baptizing many, many people now. He's becoming greater than you. John the Baptist said, he must be greater, I must be less small. This is the characteristics of great godly people. And what Jesus said about John the Baptist? John the Baptist in Jesus onward is the greatest prophets of all. And just look at John the Baptist never did many miracles. John the Baptist, as far as I know, never spoke in tongue. But Jesus said, John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And what message shall he preach? Repent and prepare the way for the Lord. For the kingdom of God is near. Repent. The last point that I have is uh, Acts 15, verse 1 and Acts 15, verse 31. In all church contexts, however great the person, there is bound to have conflicts. Okay? You have lived long enough to know in churches, there are always conflicts. And we see this also in uh, the book of Acts between uh, Paul and the uh, Barnabas. There were two conflicts that were recorded. Conflict number one was in verse uh, in 15 verse 1. That made Barnabas and Paul argue so sharply. They were shouting at each other, argue. It was on the dispute of circumcision. Because some of the Jewish people came and said, for you to be saved, you must be circumcised. And then they had the argument. Alright? And this argument, as a result, has brought in one of the best things in Christendom, in Christianity. It is because of this dispute that the church council met and discussed Discuss and they elaborated, ponder it, and pray about it. And this is where the first time the concept of we are saved through grace, saved through grace came out. Yeah, chapter 15 was in a gothic book. Although the more famous verse, verses are saved by grace through faith, mostly in efficient book, efficient book. You know, where was the point that people argue about this? It is when the Jewish people, especially the, those who are learned in the Bible, came and said, according to our rules, our custom, you must be circumcised. Then only you can be saved. So for Gentiles, for people like us, if you want to be saved, first you have to become Jews, observe all the Jewish laws, and then you are to the bottom, then only you can become a Christian. This year, number two. <laughs> I see you're sleeping, so I'm throwing that again. Okay? Point number two was uh, chapter 15, verse 39. And this dispute was even more serious. And if you read and you say, why it's so serious that we have to part? It's over preference. It's like our church, right? <laughs> it's like many churches, right? Sometimes we argue on cultural practice. Sometimes we argue on preference. Paul wants to bring Barnabas, and Barnabas suggests, let's bring Mark. Paul said, no, I don't like Mark. I don't want to bring him. Barnabas said, no, I want Mark to go with me. Paul said, no. Mark's, uh, Barnabas said, yes. No, yes. Okay, you go your own way. I go my own way. <laughs> and they parted. The point is, there are conflicts, there are going to be conflicts in the church based on cultural practice or the premise. But one thing we learn from the book of Acts,
facts from uh, Barnabas is that the uh, principle that the whole world did not change. Even though they parted the principle of building up the church, the principle of mentoring, building up people to build the church did not change because Barnabas went to another place with Mark and Paul went with Silas. So it's not because I argue with you in church and then I'm going to go off and leave the church. How shallow is the faith? I ask you to read the last part, Galatians 2 1 just now because it gave just one word. Sometimes it's very interesting the word of God, right? Just one little word can show you many things. The words in Galatians 2.1 say that, 2.1 say that, 14 years later, 14 years later, Paul, Paul went back to the churches, went back to, to, to the churches, and who he brought? He brought Barnabas. It's very interesting, right? They fought, they parted, but 14 years later, they can make another journey together. This showed me that reconciliation was done, there was no ill feeling. They can, they can serve the Lord together despite having all this uh, dispute and difference in opinion. Summary is uh, the church grew very rapidly. This is 2,000 years ago story recorded in the Bible. And you are 2,000 years later and you know if you study history and you know how the church grew. So our faith is very deeply rooted, not only on all this faith that we have, but also in the historical facts that you can read. Right, so the things that we believe in, in the church that we do this morning, coming to worship the Lord, is not of things that are, uh, simply be swept away. It has rich <coughs> tradition, it has a uh, strong uh, rooting and the uh, key rooting is in the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to do a summary of what we have learned today. Summary point number one. The church needs headhunters like Barnabas. In fact, I believe churches that do not have people like Barnabas do not go they done. If the church do not recognize, identify, train, and groom people. You know that. In Europe, if you go, I mentioned before, a lot of churches just like, the bigger they are, the nicer music or tourism spot they are. Very sad. Number two. If you think that you are an unknown person, you are a person who do not want to stand in front of the lab to be in the limelight so called. We want to acknowledge there is a slot or spot for everyone because we are building a body. You are not building a building, you are building a body of Christ. In your body or on your body, there are spots that we cover. We don't need to, don't need to see. You can be made low profile. But there is a role for everyone in the church. Because again, we are building up the body of Christ. So here I want to put a record and acknowledge the many, many people in our church in this church, who have contributed, they have done great things for the church, and they remain in the background. We don't know them. We don't know their names. And we want to acknowledge them. And I know, on the day of recognition and judgment, the Lord will recognize you. Number three, the summary is, be hunted. Allow yourself to be hunted. If you want to grow, 
find a spiritual mentor. Again, very sad to say that in our workplace we want a mentor, we have friends, mentor friends, but in the church, many, many, many do not have spiritual mentor. As such, they cannot grow spiritually. Their feeling is only Sunday, 30 minutes, and even the 30 minutes, 50 minutes is somewhere else, their minds are somewhere else. If they go back and do serious study, that's like what the church is encouraging for. I believe they have some feeling. But in most cases, especially the younger generation, okay, because destruction is great. Destruction is so great. We have no time. Face the reality. If you do not know how to discipline yourself, and in this case, maybe getting a mentor to mentor you. There's no way you can grow strong and deeply rooted in the Word of God. And you cannot walk with your hands up as a Christian. Number four. Number four is from the point, the last point, that nothing can stop us from building up the body of Christ. The devil's job is to steal, kill, and to destroy the church. His job is to blur you, distract you. Okay? And that's what is happening. Okay? To make you so busy with so many things that you have no time for the Lord and you have perfectly good excuse. But nothing can stop the church from being you. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. Not you. Jesus said, I, Jesus, will build my church. It's not you. It's not a politician. It's not uh, it's not pastor. It's not, it's not any of you. But he, but he wants you to be his partners to build the church. And the last one is this. Who is greater? Barnabas or Paul? After you have this. question to you is, can you be a Barnabas or a Paul? The church is waiting for Barnabas, many more Barnabases or Paul. Either you say that I am just a person that I don't want to speak, I, I don't like to go to the front, yes, there's a place for you. Or you want to be Paul, yes, okay, be humble, look at Paul. He was humble enough to listen to Barnabas, to study about the pedigree of Paul, the background of Paul, how talented, how clever, how smart this guy is. Sharp minds, very clever. But when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, it's no more the cleverness, but the heart was changed. And how he made this of all his abilities and his talents to build a church. So those are the five points that uh, summarize. It's not exhaustive. I believe uh, if you do some studies on your own, there are many more points about Barnabas. So I want to summarize and close today. Yeah, although the topic seems a bit, uh, a bit strange, Barnabas, uh, hit the, uh, and then we tell people, I am yeah, it's Christian, you see. Let me tell you all, on the top people say, it's not, it's not. So, what is meant here is that we want to build the church. We want to build the church that stand on the foundation of what Jesus Christ has done. I'll show you just now. This was given to Moses. But the church cannot just stand on the principles of, I am saved by Jesus Christ. And that, that's it. Then it's just like you getting a passport. Getting a passport and never go to the airport. And never been to another country. And when people say, oh, it's so nice that I've been to this country, that country, and you look at your passport, oh, how I wish I can go to another country. Oh, how nice, what you say. The Christian life is after receiving Jesus Christ, and you move from the outer core based on the foundation of what Jesus has done. You move. We are not saved by works, 
but we are safe for good works. It is only through these works that you face challenges that you hold you, that you shape your characters. And then you move. You move by the Holy Spirit. And then you serve. And your main aim is in the Holy Communion in the presence of the Lord. That was this morning that we say. That's why when we come on Sunday, we say, Lord, for the past one week, Lord, I've trusted you, and this is what I've done, Lord. Thank you. Lord, and there's a great celebration in His presence. Let's all pray together. Oh, Father God, indeed, your word, oh Lord, your word is what we hold on to in our lives. For it is not uh, by our strength or our might, but it is by your spirit. So Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that your word will go to the hearts of your people sitting here this morning, and it will change and transform their life. That truly, Lord, every day they say in your presence, in the Lord, in your communion. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray.